In this video, we are going to study about the neonatal skull or the fetal skull. So, in the neonatal skull, the facial skeleton is very small. It is about one seventh the size of the cranium, whereas in the adult, it will be the half the size of the cranium. So, this this, uh, this is due to the rudimentary form of the mandible and the maxilla and the non-eruption of the teeth and the small size of the cavity like maxillary sinus and the nasal cavity. So remember the facial skeleton is one seventh of the cranial size. So when you see the angle of the mandible, the angle of the mandible is obtuse and it is 140 degree and if you see the height of the coronoid process, the coronoid process is higher than the condylar process, than the condylar process. The mandible as such present as two halves. And it is united in the center by the fibrous tissue forming the symphysis mentate. So this symphysis men mentate, uh, this will be completely ossified into bone within the two years. And you have six unossified areas or the fontanelles in the skull. In the neonatal skull. So you have an unpaired anterior and posterior fontanelles and the pad anterolateral or the sphenoidal fontanel and a pair of posterolateral and mastoid fontanel. So there are a six fontanel, an anterior fontanel, posterior fontanel, and two anterolateral or sphenoidal fontanel, and two posterolateral or mastoid fontanels. So this is an image of the fetal skull. So you can see the fetal skull, the facial skeleton is very small when compared to the cranium and uh, the uh, mandible will be present as uh, two halves and in the center it will be connected by the symphysis mentate. So this area will be the symphysis mentate. And you can see very well here, you can see the anterior fontanel. And on either side, these are the anterolateral fontanel or the sphenoidal fontanel. So why the fontanels appear? So in the parietal bone, the ossification starts in the parietal tuber and spread out centrifugally. So, the ossification will be more on the borders than at the angles. So, there it remains as the membrane forms the fontanel. So, this is the side view of the fetal skeleton, fetal skull. So, here you can see the anterior fontanel. So, this is the anterior fontanel and this is the, this is the posterolateral fontanel or mastoid fontanel and if you go here so this is the anterolateral or sphenoidal fontanel and this is the posterior fontanel so these are the membrane filled spaces in the fetal skull that forms the fontanel so what is the importance of the fontanel so this helps in molding so this is this helps in molding uh, during the parturition or the delivery so this helps in molding that is the bone that overlap each other that is called as the molding during the birth of the fetus these fontanels also allow the prolific growth of the brain which takes place during the first year of the life the sphenoidal fontanel closes by uh, three to four months. The mastoid fontanel closes at the age of one year. 
and the anterior fontanel closes by the age of one and a half to two years. The posterior fontanel closes by the age of two to three months. The internal ear, the tympanic cavity, the mastoid antrum, and the ear ossicles. So all these will assume the adult size at birth itself. But the bony part of the external acoustic meatus is not a developed in the newborn. So because the tympanic plate of the temporal bone is represented by the C-shaped ring where the tympanic membrane is attached very obliquely facing almost horizontally to the floor of the external meatus. The tympanic membrane of the newborn is near to the surface and it might be injured during the uh, during uh, introducing the speculum the oral speculum so if you use an oral speculum in the newborn you should be careful that it is closer to the surface the tympanic membrane is closer to the surface next we'll see the mastoid process the mastoid process is absent at birth and it starts to develop after two years because of the pull of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and due to the movement of the head. And uh, when you see, because of the absence of the mastoid process, the stylomastoid foramen, which transmits the facial nerve, is close to the surface behind the pinna. So care should be taken when you put an incision behind the pinna in newborns. So next we'll see the mastoid antrum. So this mastoid antrum, uh, when you see the distance between the mastoid antrum and from the supramiatal triangle, the boundaries of the supramiatal triangle is dealt in the normal lateralis. So if you want to check the boundaries, you can go to the video of the normal lateralis. The link will be given at the end of this video. So the di distance between the supramiatal triangle and the mastoid antrum in the newborn is 2 millimeter and it increases for every year about 1 millimeter until it reaches the 12 millimeter of which is an adult distance between the supramiatal triangle and the mastoid antrum. So next we will see the anterior fontanel and its importance. Anterior fontanel is a diamond shaped uh, membrane filled space which is present between the coronal suture. So this is the coronal suture and this is the sagittal suture and this is the frontal suture. So between these sutures you have the space that is the anterior fontanel. So it is bounded anteriorly by the two halves of the frontal bone and behind by the parietal bone and this is the when you take the measurement it is 4 centimeters long and the breadth is the 2.5 centimeters and beneath this you have the superior uh, sagittal sinus and you can see readily palpate this anterior fontanel in the infants and uh, this help uh, you can see the pulsation also because of the cerebral artery and this anterior fontanel closes by 18 months to 2 years so what are the importance of the anterior fontanel so it helps in the age determination if there is any delayed closure it may because of the disturbance of the calcium metabolism or due to the deficiency of the vitamin D and any abnormal bulging of the fontanel may be because of the increased intracranial tension increased intracranial tension so whenever there is a depression in the anterior fontanel that denotes the dehydration next you can withdraw the blood from the superior sagittal sinus through the anterior fontanel and uh, you can 
introduce the needle to the lateral ventricle when you pass the needle downwards and laterally from the lateral angles of the anterior fontanel in this direction so in this direction this is the lateral angle so if you pass a needle downwards and laterally it will enter into the lateral ventricle next we'll see the growth of the skull the growth of the skull takes place by three method one the cartilage is getting replaced by the bone next is by the growth at the sutures and the third by the surface deposition of the bone externally and simultaneously you get the resorption resorption of the bone internally so three types cartilage getting replaced by bone and the growth of the sutures and the surface deposition of the bone externally simultaneously there will be resorption of the bone from internally the growth of the skull is studied in three different ways separately the growth of the vault the growth of the base and the growth of the facial skeleton as they do not proceed in the same rate so you have to study the growth of the vault the growth of the base and the growth of the facial skeleton so growth of this vault if you see it is more rapid during the first year next up to 7 years it proceeds very slowly next when you see the growth at the sutural margins or more during the first 2 years and this is followed by the oppositional growth on the external surface during the next few years so this produces an alteration in the curvatures of the vault of curvatures of the vault next the growth in the width of the vault so growth in the width takes place at uh, certain areas like sagittal suture then occipital mastoid suture and around the greater wing of the sphenoid so and at the cartilaginous petro occipital junction joints so here whenever there is growth in this area it causes the growth in the width of the vault so next is the growth in the height of the vault the growth in the height takes place at the frontozygomatic suture then it takes place at the tedion the astrion and the squamosal suture so in this area it causes an increase in the height at birth the cranial vault is unilaminar it gets differentiated into outer table inner table and an intervening diploid tissue by the age of fourth year so by the age of fourth year you can see the outer table inner table and the diploid tissue there are four diploic vein and uh, appears in the diploic tissue one is the frontal diploic vein so this frontal diploic vein drains into the supra orbital vein then you get the anterior temporal diploic vein so this drains into the sphenio parietal sinus then you get the posterior temporal diploic vein so this uh, drains at the junction of the transverse and the sigmoid sinus and you get the occipital diploic vein so this 
drains into the confluence of sinuses. So the diploic tissue is drained by the four diploic vein, the frontal diploic vein which drains into the supraorbital vein, the anterior temporal diploic vein which drains into the sphenoparietal sinus and the posterior temporal diploic vein drains at the junction of the transverse and the sigmoid sinus and the occipital diploic vein drains into the confluence of sinuses. Next we will see the growth of the base. The growth of the base causes an increase in the length of the skull. So it causes an increase in the length of the skull. So where it takes place? So it takes place at the cartilaginous joint between the body of the sphenoid and the ethmoid bone and also between the basi occiput and the basi sphenoid. So this basi sphenoid. So this synchondrosis, it persists from 18 to 25 years up to 18 to 25 years and because of this prolonged period, there will be an expansion of the jaws for the accommodation of the teeth and also it provides a surface area for the muscles of the mastication and also for the growth of the nasopharynx. Next we will see the growth of the facial skeleton. The growth of the facial skeleton is more prolonged when compared with the cranial vault. It is more prolonged because for the growth of the teeth and growth of the orbit, the upper part of the nasal cavity and the paranasal yeah, sinuses. So because of this growth, it allows the facial skeleton to grow for a prolonged period. At birth, the lower border of the orbit and the floor of the nasal cavity they lie more or less in the same horizontal plane. After the first two years the maxilla is pushed medially and downwards by the growth of the nasal septum and also the maxillary yeah, sinuses. So during this period the growth of the width of the face occurs at the symphysis mente so it occurs at the symphysis mente here and at the internasal suture and in the frontal suture so because of this it allows the growth of the width of the face and at the mid palatal suture also at the end of the second year when the sutural growth ceases there will be an expansion of the facial skeleton which takes place because of the oppositional growth. Oppositional growth. So wherever the oppositional growth of the face takes place. So it takes place at the outer surfaces of the alveolar processes, the under surface of the heart palate. This is associated with the resorption of the wall of the maxillary sinuses and the inner surface of the alveolar process and the upper surface of the heart palate. So because of this there will be a growth, oppositional growth of the face takes place. Next we will see the obliteration of the sutures. So this obliteration of the suture occurs in the cranial ward. It occurs between the age of 30 to 40 years. Initially it starts from the inner surface of the cranial vault and then it extends to the outer surface. So this sutural closure extends from the bregma, then it follows the sagittal suture, then it extends to the coronal suture, finally it occurs in the lambdoid suture. So this completes an overall view about the neonatal skull. Thanks for watching that video. Subscribe for my channel.